So in this lecture, I'm going to continue with higher functioning. And here I'm specifically going to look at some of the screening tests that we get, as well as the other higher mental functions that we also can be associated with pathology sitting in the cortex. So this is basically a summary of all of the functions of the specific lobes inside the cortex. So we, here we can see they are subsequently divided up into the frontal lobes, the um, parietal lobes, as well as the occipital lobe, and then the temporal lobes. I'm going to look at some of these functions that we can see with these lobes, but it's always important to remember that we take the central sulcus, and then we go anteriorly, which is output functioning, and then posterior, which is input or perception. And then we're going to have the dorsal, the where pathway and the what pathway, and again dividing the hemispheres into its left and right hemisphere. And then you're going to basically make sense of all of these functions that we get inside the cortex. So I think all of us have so far seen that the way that we assess with higher functioning is to do a cognitive assessment on these patients. You cannot do a scan, blood or CSF to see whether a patient's got a cognitive problem. You have to investigate them clinically and clinical intuition is going to point to this side. We do, although, have to perform certain things and to, in order to investigate the cause of the cognitive disorder. But on its own, to assess a cognitive disorder, you have to do that clinical investigation, uh, that clinical, your clinical intuition is going to guide you here. So this is one of the tests that we can use to screen a patient for a cognitive problem and that's called the bedside mental status examination. It's important to remember that this is not equivalent to the GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale. The Glasgow Coma Scale only assesses whether a person is awake or not, whether the patient has got stupor, lethargy or in a coma. So or maybe even in a vegetative state. So this is not what we're doing with a bedside mental status examination. Here, we're doing a quick screen of the specific lobes that we find in the brain. So we're going to do orientation, orientation to time, place and person and situation. That's more of a frontal lobe function. And then we're going to look at memory, so immediate memory, which is also a frontal lobe, and then short-term and long-term memory, which is temporal lobe functioning. And then um, finding information, again, that's a frontal lobe functioning. And then speech and language, which we've already investigated quite a lot in the previous talk, where we spoke about speech and language, which is part of that, parietal lobe functioning as well as praxis abilities calculations are predominantly frontal lobe but like we like i mentioned in gutzman syndrome in the parietal lobe that there's also some calculations that occurs in that um, of a parietal lobe over the hand homunculus and then we also have visual constructional abilities which is a non-dominant parietal lobe functioning and then abstract reasoning or executive functioning which is again predominantly a frontal lobe functioning um, that we can taste for these patients. So here's a nice schematic presentation of all of the functions of the lobes. So I like this schematic presentation as it also follows the same path that we discussed in our previous presentation. So we can think of anterior to the central sulcus. We've got that frontal lobe dysfunctioning. In other words, it governs so it's output function. So you can see here, so the peace patients typically have distractibility, perseveration, a lack of drive and impulsiveness. These patients um, then have a disorder with executive functioning. And then if you look at number two here, we can see this is the parietal lobe. Again, we're going to look at the dominant and the non-dominant parietal lobe. And we've mentioned already almost all of these where we mentioned aphasias, apraxias, disorders that forms part of um, Gutzman syndrome, and then in the non-dominant parietal lobe, we get that neglect disorders, that visual spatial abnormalities. And then we, as we move posteriorly, we have the occipital lobes. Remember that's perception or input, and that basically forms the what and the where pathway if you go dorsal and ventrally. And then we can see some of the disconnection syndromes that I mentioned in the previous syndrome. Uh, in the previous lecture and then number four here that's the temporal lobes and that governs more amnesia so that would where, that's where you have memory loss okay so first we're going to start with orientation so in order to test for orientation you have to see whether the person is oriented to time place and person and this typically becomes um, distorted in a person who's got a delirium and even in amnestic patients in severe dementia patients or patients with severe 
major neurocognitive disorder, um, they can have a distortion in, 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 in these categories. But this is typically a very late finding if you think of a neurocognitive disorder. And shouldn't this shouldn't be a um, high up on your list of differentials as one as the beginning presentation when a patient comes in with an acute um, disorientation or confusional state. Um, so a loss of personality actually forms part of a psychiatric condition. Um, orientation doesn't really localize too much, but typically it's a frontal it's a frontal lobe function where you have that energization process specifically of the mesial frontal lobes that keeps you energized and keeps you orientated. Um, so if you have to localize it somewhere, we have to think of the frontal lobes being playing the major role with orientation. So the next modality that we have to assess for would be attention. So attention would be the ability to focus and direct cognitive processes and to resist distraction. So really, the, the attention is, an, is a process where you have to assess whether the person is awake and cooperative with that ability to focus. Examination of the rest of the cognitive or all of these cognitive processes are really hierarchical where you have to pass with a lower you first have to pass the lower cognitive um, examination um, screens before you can move on to the more higher functioning examinations so in other words if a person is inattentive and they cannot they cannot maintain focus then you won't be able to test whether a person has got an aphasia or an apraxia or an agnosia so this would be one of that first level processes that you have to start off with before you move on to higher uh, other higher cortical functioning so the way to assist for attention is there are basically three tests that we can do. So first off, we can start with the digit span. So a normal digit span is typically seven digits plus minus two digits. In other words, a normal person can remember um, from five up until nine digits. So the easiest way to test this with would be to use a cell phone number without, um, so recalling a cell phone number without the 072 component. Um, that would be a more or less enough digits for you. Um, to test the patient with. So simple, a simple spelling of words backwards like world or stating the months of the year in reverse is another way to do this. So this is an easy one. So you can ask the person or the, or the patient that you're testing to um, name the months of the year backwards starting in December and then you can assess their attention by doing that. And then serial threes or serial sevens depending on the person's educational level. So typically you start with 20 and you have to ask the person to count backwards from 20 in threes. So if you um, don't, if you lose the ability, if you um, fail any of these tests, then it is a hallmark function of frontal lobe dysfunction. And that is usually typically indicative of delirium as being the culprit causing this inattentive inattention. So you won't be able, like I said, assess for other high cortical functioning once a person fails this assessment battery. So this is basically a summary of the two processes that we've just discussed. So we've discussed orientation and attention. So one thing that I didn't mention was a vigilance. So that's when you ask the person to tap every time when you say a specific letter. So for instance, if you say A, they must tap once with their finger. So when then you go through the alphabet and you say something like A, B, C, A, D, A. And then every time when you say A, the person needs to tap. Okay, so more on frontal lobe syndromes or disorders that governs executive functioning and behavior. So what is executive functioning? So executive function is really that interrelated cognitive functioning processes that, that governs complex goal-directed activity. Um, so we can start off with a loss of executive functioning that we typically see with a dorsal lateral frontal lobe. So in this dorsal lateral frontal lobe, there's a numerous tests that we can do. So some of the simple tests would be, again, that storytelling. So you ask a person to tell you a certain story, and again, you can do digit span or simple words like world backwards. So these are very overlapping with the tests that we just test tested when we attest when we checked for as, um, um, attention so there's also other tests that we can do for this ex uh, for dorsal lateral dysfunction or disorders of executive functioning and that would be the luria which i will show you now then there's the go no go test as well as clock drawing and the trail making procedure similarities also falls under um disorders of executive functioning as well um, yeah so that basically summarizes executive functioning and how to test executive functioning disorders
So now I'm going to go dorsal medially. So we're going to look at the dorsal medial disorder. And what we see here are basically it governs that whole um, energization process. So in other words, people with a disorder in this dorsal medial areas typically lose their energization. And therefore they elicit on this spectrum of disorders where they can sit with abulia that ranges from abulia to apathy even to akinetic mutism so you can see here it's basically you lose that energization in order to do something the way to test this would be would be to use the fas or the fast test i will show you now examples of the fast and how to perform the fast but it's more or less you can more or less see this as when you start to daydream in class and it's becoming boring and 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 this lecture is not really keeping your attention anymore then basically you're losing this dorsal medial frontal part of the frontal um, of the frontal lobes and therefore pathology sitting here in the middle aspect of the brain can affect this and then can cause this abulia apathy to akinetic mutism so let's look at the orbital frontal lesions. An orbital frontal disorder typically causes behavioral disinhibition. So a person's personality changes when you've got a lesion sitting here. They typically show emotional dysregulation and altered social cognition. Therefore, these patients become disinhibited, restless, impulsive, and shows explosive behavior. Um, so this is what happens with orbital frontal disorders. And there's some variants of, of neurocognitive syndromes that typically affects this orbital frontal area initially. One place that it's not mentioned on this slide is the, is the polar regions of the frontal lobe. And the polar regions of the frontal lobe are really an interesting area. And this is where it says it governs the theory of mind or the um, theory of cognitive processes. Um, what makes us, uh, what shows our affective behavior. Um, uh, the way that we can do this is by asking a person to test the Sally Ann, to perform the Sally Ann test, which is a story that you have to tell and you have to see whether this person can keep on following the story while you tell it. Um, um, I think this is maybe an oversimplification as we really still poorly understand this this um, this polar region of the frontal lobes, but but this is um, thought to form the the basis of the theory of our mind. So this is that executive functioning battery that I promised on the previous slide that I will show you. So here we've got a, a, a number of executive functioning that we can test for. And it's important to remember that executive functioning is stored in both frontal lobes. So you typically have to have a dysfunction in both frontal lobes to cause a dis-executive functioning. So the way to test this would be um, um, would be to do the FAS test. That's a little bit more of that mesofrontal lobe that I mentioned. But here you have to ask the person to say as many words they can and that starts with the letter F and see what their um, normal count. So a normal person should be able to say more than um, 10 to 12 words per minute. Um, a story uh, so you can also ask the person to do a story recall so telling them a story and then they have to recall that story and then we've got the luria sequence so the luria sequence is basically you have to do this first that's called the first chop homes sequence so you can do that first chop and then the home sequence and that forms part of the luria test and that's your ability to to learn new motor behaviors so a person should be able to perform this test within 12 seconds or so and then you can do the go no go test. So then you ask the person to tap every, and that's similar to the one where I said, we ask the person to tap once when you say A, and when you say C, you have to tap twice, and then you go through the alphabet and you go A, B, C, A, B, D, E, F, and then they have to tap once or tap twice. Um, your clock drawing so clock drawing forms part of frontal lobes it's a little bit different from the ones that we see with a parietal lobe dysfunction when we look at that um, neglect um, a patient with neglect so clock drawing and a frontal lobe problem typically they will be able to draw the clock but it will be a very atypical clock where they have that difficulty in planning and monitoring the clock um, the 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 clock um, picture. So I'll show you in the next slide, I will show you what a clock drawing looks like in a patient with a frontal lobe problem. And then trail making forms part of the executive functioning, which I will show you as well.
So this is basically that variance of clock drawing that you get. So in the frontal lobe, you have that difficulty in planning and monitoring the way that digits need to fall onto the um, onto the clock. So you can see here, this person started off very nicely, but then they squeezed it a little bit too much. Then they realized something was wrong, and then they jumped it to six because six is typically in the bottom of the clock. And then they started. So you can see there, there's a lot of disorder. They they know it's a so planning is there but monitoring is quite dysfunctional and this is what we see in a frontal lobe variant of clock drawing remember in the parietal variant of clock drawing you have that neglect so you won't be able to see you've got that neglect on the one side you might see it but you won't be able to recognize the visual stimuli or your visual spatial environment around the one side of your body and this is what happens with a dysfunction in the non-dominant parietal lobe so this is the trail making test that I mentioned as well, and that forms part of the ex testing that executive functioning. So what we do here is you typically start with a um, with a with a number, and then you have to alternate it with a letter. So in other words, you start with one, and then you have to link it with A, and then you go to two, and then you have to link it to B, and then you have to go to three, and then link it to C, and so on and so forth. So this is the way that you have to test for with a trail making test. So this is quite a fun test to perform. So when you post call, you can try to do this test and see how your 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 executive functioning gets disordered. But um, this is an um, this this test forms part of the mocker examination, and therefore the mocker examination is a typically a better screen to use than the other, than the mini mental um, state examination. So now we can look at memory. So so memory, remember, is, is similar to that filing cabinet that we have in our brains. So so typically. I spoke already spoke about immediate memory, and that forms part of the frontal lobes. And then after that, it gets stored into the temporal lobes as well as in the basal ganglia. So in the temporal lobes, so it follows typically that circuit of Popeyes from the frontal lobes, eventually ending up in the temporal lobe. So in the temporal lobe, you get that mesial and uh, mesotemporal lobe as well as um, a lateral temporal lobe. And that mesial temporal lobe is typically governs episodic memory, so that's explicit episodic memory, and that typically governs um, um, events that happen to you. So it's where you are, um, this, where you are the central part of that. So for instance, your birthday or something that happened to you in a specific event in time. So the semantic um, component is that general knowledge. So that's the lateral temporal lobe, and that governs more facts. Um, um, stuff that you've learned at school or at, uh, on varsity. Um, so the, these that typically go, gets filed into the semantic comp um, compartment or the lateral temporal lobe. And then implicit memory. Implicit memory is that uh, is non-conscious memory, and that's stored in the typically in the basal ganglia, and then governs procedural memory, classic conditional memory, as well as priming. So procedural memory typically governs your ability to ride a bike or or something where you um, shifting gears while driving a car, and that's procedural memory. Priming, priming. So so you, when you've got a disorder of priming, typically what will happen is you will, um, for instance, see a banana and then you'll call it yellow, and that's typically what we see when we've got a disorder of priming. Um, <laughs> As I, as I previously mentioned, so implicit, so implicit for a memory forms part of the non-declarative memory. In other words, there's no conscious recall of this. So for instance, motor skills and um, um, habits that are being programmed, and then they're stored as procedural memory, as opposed to explicit memory. And explicit memory would then form part of the declarative, or you need to consciously recall this. And that will be uh, pertaining to specific facts, like I mentioned, um, facts of um, uh, facts, uh, knowledge of facts, um, um, examples of animals or tools, um, pictures of naming tests, um, and then yeah, so this categorical memory is all form, forms also part of this um, 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 variant of, of of memory, but it governs conscious recall. And then episodic memory is also uh, pertaining to facts, but that's typically when yourself is the central part of it, um, and that forms episodic memory. So that's your experiences to specific events, etc. Um, yeah, so this is just some more information about it. Like I said, implicit memories have um, a, a, a 
common storage and retrieval mechanisms that do not involve the hippocampal system. They typically get stored in the basal ganglia and it's, uh, uh, and therefore strokes in this area of ter this territory will uh, in, the, in the recurrent opnea of Eupner, which is a branch of that anterior cerebral artery, can affect procedural memory. And therefore you have to test it in these patients in order to know whether they've got a disorder of, of, of procedural memory. So this is a very nice table explaining the memory stages and localization when you've got a deficit in each of these memories. So as we can see, we've got the immediate memory, and that's in other words known as working memory. It forms a form of explicit memory and it stores in the prefrontal cortex. After that, it, it's followed to short-term memory or episodic memory, which is another form of explicit memory. Remember, you have to actively recall this and then stored stored in the medial temporal lobe. Then in long-term memory, which is the semantic component of memory. It's also, you have to actively work in order to recall it, and that's sort of the lateral temporal lobe and cortices. And then motor memory, which is a form of procedural memory, is implicit, where you do not have to actively recall it, and that's stored in the basal ganglia as well as the cerebellum. So as I mentioned previously, immediate memory resides in, the, uh, resides in conscious awareness, um, specifically in the frontal lobes, and you have to be able to recall five to nine meaningful items, so that's seven plus minus two items in your working memory. Um, so typically the information is lost after 18 to 20 seconds if you don't think about it again and don't actively try to remember it. So disorders of working memory typically ar arise in the following conditions where strokes and neurodegenerative conditions can cause a loss of working memory as well as tumors and trauma and there are also some psychiatric conditions. And here's a pictorial representation of the areas of memory where we've got this um, explicit forms of memory stored in the prefrontal cortex as well as the temporal lobes and, um, and um, um, implicit memory is stored in the basal ganglia and cerebellum um, yeah, for that automated tasks. So a nice way to assess episodic memory is to use the four hidden object test. So what you do is you basically show the patient four different types of objects, um, hide them all in one place by covering them up with a with a, um, a blanket or a piece of paper, distract the patient for a couple of seconds, and then ask him to recall the area, the different types of objects in their specific locations. And then obviously a deficit occurs if these if the patients are unable to recall these objects within 14 seconds or less. So semantic memory governs the um, loss of um, knowledge about facts. So examples, like I said, would be able to name specific animals or picture naming tests, etc. Um, so a deficit may be specific to a, a rather specific category. So you have to different, test different types of categories in order to test whether a person's got a loss of semantic memory. And then again, we get to procedural memory. And like I said, this is a non-declarative memory. In other words, um, a person do not have to actively recall it. Um, so the way to test that would be to see whether a person is still able to ride a bicycle or driving a manual car. So now we've been through um, a lot of subdivisions of cognitive tests. And now we have to come up with a cognitive screen that combines all of these tests with each other and this forms part of the mocha examination. There are numerous other um, uh, cognitive screens that can be used like the mini mental state examination, the frontal battery test and like I said as you can delve much more into a neurobehavioral assessment um, um, examination by examining the, each every lobe in the brain extensively but the m most widely used screen that we have is the mocha examination and the way the reason why we like the mocha examination is because it incorporates a lot of frontal lobe functioning or it tests that that's inside this um, um, screen so this is the mocha or the montreal cognitive assessment and as you can see here it governs in a lot of categories and um, but this is really based upon or its limitations of this test is, is, is due to your um, 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 uh, uh, educational background as well as your cultural background 
and also obviously if you've got an underlying delirium or not so then you won't be able to proceed with this examination okay so as you can see here we've got visual spatial and executive functioning so that's visual spatial that's parietal lobe and this is my frontal lobe executive functioning when then we've got naming which forms part of naming of objects which is a parietal lobe form um, part of that parietal lobe aphasia um, um, of um, um, category as well as semantic memory and then we've got memory uh, memory where we test that episodic memory and then attention span which is a frontal lobe function and then again language uh, functioning which is that parietal lobe as well as again abstract abstraction which is another frontal lobe functioning and then delayed recall which is that lateral or um, semantic memory lateral temporal lobe functioning and then here's orientation again with a frontal lobe that's got to do with the frontal lobes so you can see there's a lot of frontal lobe functioning that's that's stipulated here in the mocha examination and then we get another test it's called the mini cock test or the mini cognitive screen so what we basically do here is you ask the person to you name three objects then you ask the person to draw a clock and then after the clock drawing you ask the person to recall those three objects so remember these are all screening tests uh, from the mocha up until the mini cock test so um so these are only used to pick up or monitor um, patients with cognitive dysfunction it's not diagnostic so this would be the frontal assessment battery and as you can see here it governs a couple of topics that we've already discussed so you get that similarities test and then you have that lexical fluency or the fas test that governs that mesial frontal lobe and then we've got the um, 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 Luria test with which is that first job homes sequence and then we've got conflicting instructions where you ask the person to tap twice when you tap once or tap once when they tap twice so this is um, this is conflicting instructions and that really has to do a lot with that executive functioning order and then also you can do the go no go test where you have to tap once when i tap once and etc and the reverse so as we can see here or that um, as we can see here this is a, a nice summary of all that frontal lobe examinations that we went through so as we can see here the clinical examination is the way to test these patients and it's not going to be dependent on a procedure or a lab test to test the patient with dementia although there are some causes that you have to exclude within these patients but it's not diagnostic for a dementia and then um, this really it's invaluable to repeat these um, examinations on a on a, on, a, on a regular basis to see whether the patient is um, cognitively regressing and um, and therefore um, uh, obviously you have to look at the patient's clinical history as well as collateral information to um, get a nice picture of what exactly is happening in each in each of these individuals and that will bring uh, the cognitive examination to an end i hope you learned something during this presentation